but in the process, here I am. See, so, yeah, I know. You bring them together, you glue them together. That's how you make a nice strong edge like this. Why am I not doing that now? Why do I just cut the edge off and sock her on there? Well, number one, it's simple. Uh, not having to taper one sixteenth inch thick foam, taper it down and bring them together, real simple. Um, well, you know, okay, so you could put in some filler there, some micro bloom when you do it and bring those two edges together and do it that way. Here's the problem. When you do a female mold, you can put a line on that mold, you can get things lined up, and you can do that taper at just the right point on the D-tube. You know exactly where to put that taper. When you do male molds over the outside, no can do. It's pretty hard to figure out. You'd have to build a ramp on the mold that you actually mold the skins together, put it on the mold, and then because this is going to be home built, every single one of these D-tubes is going to fit differently. As people go and, and build up their uh, spar and then put ribs on it, they're all going to come out a little bit different. So these things actually have to be dry fit first and trimmed to size. Except I don't know where the edge is. I don't know what the size is going to be. So the only thing you can do is dry fit it on there, mark it, right? This is halfway across the spar. This is how big it needs to be, and trim it off. And for a long time, I thought, what am I going to do to bring the skins together? How am I going to get the loads from the inner skin to the outer skin? And then, being the kind of person I am, I stop and think and go, is that even necessary? Is it really necessary to transfer the loads from the inner skin to the outer skin by bonding them together? You know, and it's just tradition in the aircraft and aerospace industry to somehow pot the edge. When you use the honeycomb stuff, when you use this honeycomb and you cut it, you go back and you pot it with epoxy and micro balloons, and that transfers the loads. Um, and I thought, well, I got foam in there, and the foam's going to carry some loads. Uh, will it be enough? And then I had to remind myself, I've designed this thing so that this inner layer of carbon fiber is strong enough to carry all the loads. Uh, it carries all of the torsional loads all by itself. The fiberglass outer skin not required in order to carry any of the loads. All the loads are carried on the inside. And the loads from this inner skin to any inner skin that I have back here is transferred across the spar cap. In fact, I designed them specifically to make sure I have fibers running this way so I can transfer the loads fore and aft on the inner skins. And the outer skins are here for aerodynamic purposes, nice and smooth, and to protect the foam. The foam is here to prevent buckling of this inner skin. Inner skin is only seven thousandths of an inch thick, six thousandths. This stuff really thin out on the wingtip. Of course, it would buckle immediately if you put loads on it. So we make a sandwich panel out of it, and the sandwich panel keeps it from buckling. And that's what makes it strong. But the outer skin is not needed to prevent that buckling for the most part. Now, when you put the outer skin on here, it does help prevent premature buckling the foam in the inner layer. You have a sandwich bit, but it's not joined up at the trailing edge. And here's the issue that the viewer was writing about. So you're flying along and you put torsional loads on this thing. And because I don't have a spar in here, I can actually demonstrate this. I can show it to you uh, to get this lined up right. So the wing wants to do this, like this. It's going to get a twist in it. When you put those, you get six G's on here and the wing starts twisting, and it's going to twist in this direction. It's like, Oh my gosh. So what kind of loads does that put in here? Well, a lot. <laughs> but the loads are on an axis like this, usually on the 45. In fact, that's why we lay up the layers on the inside on the bias. Because rather than trying to put the loads across the weave, we're carrying these torsional loads with the toe that's in there, with the toes that are running this way and the fibers that are running this way, so that these torsional loads are actually putting the carbon fiber in tension and compression, which it does well, as opposed to trying to shear the carbon fiber, uh, which carbon fiber, if you nick it, it, it doesn't withstand shear very well. It's quite brittle, it'll crack and come apart on you. Uh, they, they call it catastrophic uh, uh, failure uh, because it happens all at once. So we orient the fibers. In fact, the fibers on the fiberglass on the outside, same thing. They run on the diagonal like this, and they help carry those torsional loads. Plus the spar is in here, and the spar is helping carry some of those torsional loads. 
So as long as we prevent the skin from buckling, we're good to go. Now, what would happen if the torsional loads get high enough so that you have a problem with this open trailing edge? Well, let, let's talk about what that is, what that's like for a moment. Let me get another sample out of here. So when we put torsional loads on here like this, the loads are running diagonally like this in the two directions. So what you're doing is you're actually putting the upper and lower surfaces in shear. One, one surface wants to pull this way, the other one wants to pull this way. And you're trying to shear them apart like this. And all of that shear goes into the foam. So its ability to withstand shear is the shear capability of the foam or the bond line capability between the foam and your skin. Now, if you've ever pulled any of these things apart, and I'm not going to pull this one apart further. Where's my uh, sacrificial lamb over here? When you pull these things apart, usually, now this is Kevlar. It comes out a little bit different. Here, the Kevlar is peeling off the foam and taking the resin with it, and some of the resin is left behind on the foam. Other ones that you pull off, it literally, when you don't have Kevlar, if you have fiberglass or carbon fiber, it will actually peel off a layer of the foam. It just takes a layer of the foam with it. Uh, because it's very, the bond between uh, the epoxy resin and Kevlar cloth itself is relatively low, that bond line fails uh, before you fail the foam. Uh, you get such a high, sh strong bond between the epoxy and fiberglass or carbon fiber that it actually fails the foam. Either way, it peels off. So as long as we're... Peel strength, nothing. Just pull it off with your hands, not a problem. Piece of cake. Oh, and here we see, maybe you can see it's starting to pull some of the foam with it. Got a little bit of bond there. So, but I'm not using Kevlar because it's not very dent resistant. Fiberglass is much better on that. So the failure is in the foam. So you go look up, what is the sheer strength of foam? And it varies depending upon the density of the foam. At the low end, where you're like two and a half pounds per cubic foot, three pounds per cubic foot, it's around 40, 50 PSI is the sheer strength. So, um, for every square inch of that of foam, you could put 50 pounds of shear in it before it fails. Um, and as you go up in density, as you get up around six, seven pound density foam, well, it starts getting up around 80 PSI. And you think, was well, that enough? At least that's what most people would think. I, on the other hand, go, geez, am I building this good enough? am I actually going to realize the full shear strength of the foam? So I, I don't have pictures or video of it. It's just something I do on the side. I make little coupon samples, you know, piece of foam. Well, I, I do a sandwich panel like this. I do one of these sandwich panels, and I'll slice it up, and I'll remove fabric from two of the sides so that I can grab the two sides of the fabric and pull. And the first time I did one of those samples, a little one-inch square, because uh, I know I'm shooting for about 50 pounds, and I... I just pull this apart with my hands. You know, I'm looking at it and go, this is nothing. And I grabbed the two pieces of fabric and pulled with all my might. And I was just shocked it wouldn't come apart. You could just pull and pull and pull. I literally didn't have the physical strength, uh, sufficient strength to pull it apart. And it's only one square inch. And I thought, okay, I'll jig it up. And I did, and I rigged it up uh, so I could do a little more scientific of a test on them. And I started testing them, and sure enough, I'm getting right around 50, 60 PSI. And so, oh, good. I'm failing the foam where it's supposed to fail, and my bonding and all the other stuff is, is on the numbers, and I'm achieving the strength I'm supposed to achieve. But is 40 enough? 50 enough? 60 enough? And you can go and look at the calculations, and as part of this video, I'll provide a link uh, to uh, a standard calculation for calculating shear in the, in the foam between two, two face sheets. Uh, the math is a little complicated. You can go do it if you want. Uh, I chose not to uh, because you stop and think about this. You go, okay, here's a six-foot long stretch of D-tube, and I'm good to about 50 PSI in shear, and I'm bonded for about three-quarters of an inch wide. Well, that's 60 inches, 72 inches. 72 times 50. Wow. <laughs> That's like, what is that number? Let's see, 70 to 720 times 5. That's like 3,500 pounds a shear. 
That's, that's tons. We're getting up around a couple of tons of force that it would take to shear these two skins apart. And not only that, it's not just the area that's bonded over the top of the spar. It, the loads drop off, but it's a lot of this upper surface. So in terms of shear between the two layers, we're talking tons and tons and tons of force it would take to shear these apart. So why do we close them off at the edge? Oh, it's a good question. Why do we do that? Peeling. As long as you don't peel, you'll achieve this tons of force, of shear force that you can carry in that foam. And who would ever have thought this flimsy foam could carry tons and tons and tons? But it can, because it's a large area. So, as long as you don't peel, as soon as you start to peel, pow, it'll come apart. Because peeling strength on this stuff is like next to nothing. You get no peel strength on this stuff. So if an edge starts to come up, you're in trouble. And that's why we seal off the edges. So we can't ever start a peel. So I did something that's a little tricky on this to, to deal with that peeling issue. And I'm going to set this out of the way. So in areas where I've butted the two skins together like this, I have this Oracle. 651 on the front, it's a stretchy vinyl, super sticky. This is meant to be used outdoors for years and years and years, and you squeegee it on it, and it is really stuck. And when I wrap this on, I actually go over that seam where the two are. So it's not that I'm transferring loads with the stretchy vinyl, no. I'm just covering up the seam so peeling can't get started. So you don't start getting edges lifting up here and, and you prevent degradation due to UV and all that because this is UV, totally UV resistant. Um, and uh, so in situations like this, I'm just sealing off that edge with the Oracle to prevent an edge from starting to lift up and starting a peel, which would be bad. Uh, and of course, over time, years of usage, this is something that's easy to visually inspect. You can just look down the edge, and if you see any puckers or pulls, uh, you can remove the Oracle, take a look at it. Maybe you need to put some glue in, stick it back down, and put some new covering over the top of it. So this is a, maybe a little bit of maintenance. Now, in areas where I have fabric, I put the fabric on first, and I have a video coming up you should watch for about how this wing is actually covered in the fabric and how I carry the loads from the fabric. But the fabric's put on first and attached to the D-tube. It's literally glued on and ironed onto the D-tube with standard adhesives that you use for putting covering on aircraft, on ultralight aircraft. And then the Oracle comes on and goes over the top of the covering and uh, where the step faces aft, because that's good aerodynamically and in terms of uh, strength and inspection and all that. So uh, I'm transferring the loads from the uh, D-tube into the aft skin that way. And the skin is transferring loads into the uh, structure via the uh, rib cap strips, which is conventional. Uh, you know, on high-speed aircraft, the fabric's actually stitched on and glued on, and then for ultralights, we just glue it on, and, and that's a certified way of doing it. So you're transferring the loads from the fabric into the, spar or into the rib caps, into the rib, up to the spar, into the D-tube. So that's how that's done. That's why I did it that way, and um, uh, I've tested it. I know it works in bending. Will it work in torsion? Well, I think so, uh, because I use a, another fabulous engineering tool. Some people have this tool, some people don't. Uh, and for those of you who don't know about it, I'm going to introduce it. Let me grab my whiteboard here. I'm going to hold it up here for you to see. And uh, maybe you can see that. It's uh, TLAR, T-L-A-R. Uh, and some people know this, some people don't. And for those of you who don't, I'll, re I'll reveal the, uh, the tool itself. And if I bring this up, you can probably see it. And it's what we call, that looks about right. And it's a little engineering joke for all you nerds out there. But you wouldn't believe how often I use this in my designs. I take a look and I go, that looks about right. That should work. Now, the formal term for this is called engineering judgment. Um, and when you're in an area that's not critical, you can use that, provided you have the experience, the training, the experience uh, of doing this. And be because I've been at this for 30 some odd years, 40 years, I I've built aircraft, I've restored aircraft, I've designed them, I'm a pilot, um, 
I can look at these things and go, oh, that's similar to another aircraft that I saw, and I know that that works. Or I tested it in the past on some little coupon sample, and I know that that works. Uh, and, and it's just all of that experience brought together and says, I'm, I'm comfortable with this approach, and it should work. Uh, now, does that guarantee that's going to work? No. <laughs> By all means, no. Uh, and that's why you have to test. And now my wing's been tested in bending, so then I know this open aft edge peachy on bending. We saw no deformation, no movement, nothing. Uh, in fact, the wing is phenomenally stiff. Uh, so I know it works in bending. Does it work in torsion? That I don't know yet. I think it will. I, I don't have a good way of testing uh, on a sample the torsional uh, shear strength of the material without that edge closed off. Uh, so it, right now it's just on engineering judgment. However, when the aircraft is finished, we will do a test load on it. We'll actually sandbag the whole thing. And little by little, we'll work our way up and keep an eye on it and, and see if this uh, becomes a problem. Because when we load the whole wing up, it's going to be loaded with the torsional loads that it experiences in flight. We'll find out. What if I'm wrong? Well, then it was an expensive mistake. Because I'll get back. <laughs> I'll get a chance to go back and build new mid-span wing panels using a different method that's stronger. Uh, but it's probably going to be one of these cases where, oh, uh, we loaded it to 1G, not a problem. 2, not a problem. 3... Oh, and somebody says, hey, look at this, Raul. It's starting to, to pucker up a little bit here, and maybe this is a problem. And we'll go, stop, stop, stop the test. We've got an issue, you know. Maybe it'll be a patch job where you go, oh, that was a bad spot. We need to fix it. We patch it up. And we take it to 3.5Gs. Oh, no, it's buckling over here. Oh, okay, we have a problem then. It's only good to 3Gs. Well, then we're going to go out and test fly the aircraft and just do those little hops down the hill. It's not like I'm going to go out and do aerobatics in it and do spins and all that other stuff. In other words, we restrict the flight envelope to uh, what the aircraft is capable of carrying in loads and, and get flight testing done that way. And while we're doing that flight testing, in the background, I'm going to be building another set of wing panels uh, that uh, uh, are not built in this crazy method of just leaving the aft edge open. So that's kind of the whole story behind that. Uh, and uh, some people will say, well, you can bring them together and just leave a flange of fiberglass and carbon fiber like this and, and cut that. Well, yes and no. Because if you're off by too much, if you have too much flange between the foam and the spar, and we're only two layers thick of this really thin fabric, you got two layers of two ounce fabric and it, it's nothing. It's like this. If I have too much of this between, if I have too much just this layer like this between the foam and the spar, oh, well, here you go. There you go, that's a problem. So you have to build so accurately that this foam is like almost at the edge of this flange. That foam has to come right up to the flange like that. Most home builders are not gonna be able to build that accurate. There's gonna be some kind of distance in between. Short distances, not a problem. Big distances, I think you just saw, it's a bit of a problem. So it's better to have it this way. Look, I got, I got foam and fiberglass and carbon fiber going all the way aft. That's the right answer in this particular case. Worse comes to worse, I can come in here and sand here and sand here and put a layer of like three ounce tape on here, epoxy down there, fill it in with some body filler, smooth it out, That'll be one piece of fiberglass fore and aft like this, almost as if you'd sealed off the edges like this is one piece, and it's just going to make a little bump in the airfoil, and it's going to muck up the aerodynamics a little bit, but it will make it structurally sound, and that will allow me to expand the flight envelope of the test aircraft so I can continue testing while I build another set of wing panels. So that's what this is really about, uh, and that's how I do some of the uh, engineering uh, on this, it's uh, a judgment call. And it's something that I feel okay with uh, because of my experience and so forth. But that doesn't prevent me from being dead wrong. And we'll find out in the long run. Was Raul right or was he wrong? So I hope you enjoyed that little segment and it tells you how you can go about these things and make these estimates and, and just move forward with your design without spending months and months trying to learn some fancy piece of software or whatever. And, and by the way, here's my opinion on, on all the software packages and all the calculations. They are theoretical. None of that stuff is 100% uh, correct. 
it gets you really, really close. But there can be, you build a model to put into one of those pieces of software, might be right, might not. It might not actually represent reality. You have to build some really, really detailed models, and you have to have all of the characteristics of your particular construction method in that model in order to get an accurate result. And um, I don't think I'd use any of those uh, uh, software models without actually going and testing also. Uh, it, it, both ways are risky uh, and better to testing and, and uh, doing it that way. So uh, thanks for watching. I rambled on here. I hope you enjoyed this segment. Uh, I'm going to do a segment uh, right now on a new SPAR concept that I have. And then I'm going to have another segment coming on uh, covering. Uh, and those will roll out separately, but I hope you come back and watch those. And please, if you would, uh, subscribe. Uh, that's always a huge help. Uh, more su subscribers are better. Keep writing those comments in. It gets me thinking. And um, uh, if you have a mind to, if you uh, feel that you're getting something of value out of these, uh, please go over to my Patreon site, become one of my patrons. Uh, if you stay a patron until I fly my wing, you get your name on the wing. And you get a free set of plans for the quarter scale RC model. And uh, for a few bucks a month, uh, you can really help out. So thanks much. Fly safe and bye for now.